and welcome to today's Pedestrian and Bicycle Information Center AASHTO Bike Guide Series webinar. Today's webinar is titled Bicycle Planning, and we will be speaking with R.J. Eldridge, Planner, I'm sorry, Director of Planning at Tool Design Group, and Peter Lagerway, Senior Planner, which is also at Tool Design Group. My name is James Gallagher, and I am the PBIC Communications Manager. I'll be facilitating today's webinar. I'd first like to say hello to today's speakers to make sure that they are there, that they are ready, and that everyone can hear them. RJ, are you there? Yep. And Peter, do we have you on the line as well? I'm here. Attendees, if you can hear me and if you can hear our speakers, please click the hand icon in the box in the upper right corner of your screen so we can be sure that you can hear us. Great. It looks like everyone can hear us. Before we get started with today's webinar, I want to go over a few administrative details and the functionality of the webinar software. If for some reason your computer or web browser freezes during the webinar, please reload the website and log back into the program. You'll be able to rejoin the session. Please note that attendees will not be able to speak during the webinar. We do expect a large number of attendees on this call, so by meeting your audio, it helps us to cut down confusion and background noise. As an attendee, you have a control box in the upper right corner of your screen that collapses and expands by clicking the double arrow. Though you are not able to speak, you do have the ability to ask questions by entering them in the question box. If you have a problem during the webinar, you may enter it here. I'll monitor these questions and respond to you if I am able. Questions pertaining to the presentation may be asked at any time, but they will not be addressed until the end of the program, and we have built in about 20 minutes for discussion period. Please feel free to ask questions as we go along, we will try to get to them after the presentation. When you exit the webinar, there's a brief survey that will pop up. We would very much appreciate your feedback on our performance. Following today's webinar, you will receive an email that will include a link to download a printable certificate of attendance for one and a half hours of instruction. If there are multiple attendees at your site, please forward this link to other participants so they can download and print the certificate with their name. This webinar has been submitted to AICP and has been approved for one and a half PM credit. The Road Safety Academy, the training and education arm of the UNC Highway Safety Research Center, is a registered provider of CM credit. For more information on the Road Safety Academy, please visit www.rsa.unc.edu. Also, AASHTO has agreed to provide a 20% discount to attendees of this webinar series. Details for how to get that discount will be provided in the follow-up email. This is the second of seven webinars in the AASHTO Bike Guide. For more information on those and future webinars, or to view the archives from this webinar series and others, please visit www.walkinginfo.org slash webinar. In addition to these webinars, PBIC offers four different in-person training courses to provide technical assistance to professionals and community members in developing pedestrian safety action plans and in improving conditions for walking. These courses can be found at www.walkinginfo.org slash training. Before I turn the screen over to RJ and Peter for their feature presentation, I want to take a quick poll from the audience. Please let me know how many people are watching this webinar at your site. Great, thank you very much. And I have one second question for you. Thank you for answering those questions. Before I turn the screen over, I'm sorry, I'd like to welcome and thank RJ and Peter for their presentation today. We will take questions at the end. RJ and Peter, please take it from here.
Okay. Um, can you see it? Hello? Yes, we can see it. Okay, great. Well, welcome to uh, the second in the webinar series. This is uh, planning guidance in the 2012 uh, Bike Ashto Guide. And for some reason, my screen is not moving forward. Um, I don't know if, James, you can help me on this. Um, the screen is not moving. Certainly. Let, let me help you there. OK. OK, there we go. You got it? Okay. I got it. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so today's webinar is going to cover uh, Chapter 2 in the Bike Astro Guide, Planning Guidance in the 2012 Bike Guide. Um, in front of you there, you have a list of the topics and updates and new content that's provided uh, in the guide. Uh, I'm not going to read you the whole list, but just make a couple general introductory remarks uh, about this chapter. Uh, two things, I think, to, to be aware of. And uh, these are significant, and they're going to come up uh, over and over again throughout the presentation this morning. Uh, one of the things that the planning uh, guidance does is have a lot of discussion on where bicycle facilities should be placed. And we'll get into some of those details a little later on. And then secondly, I think this is really important, is, it tell, is once you figured out where facilities should be placed, it talks about then is, is what kind of facilities appropriate. And this is new guidance. And so the first time it gets into things like road characteristics, speed, and volume. So uh, a lot of good new information here. Um, also, too, is this is probably the, the least technical of the webinars that are going to be presented. Um, but it really is important in the sense that it, it forms the, the, um, really the backdrop for the subsequent chapters in the guide and the subsequent webinars, because uh, the planning really guides you know, what should be, what should be uh, installed, where it should be installed. And then the subsequent uh, chapters give you all the details on how do you design it and how do you put it in. Uh, next slide. For some reason, um, it's not changing for me. James, can you can you uh, move the slides for me? Yeah, I'm taking control of the screen. Okay, sorry about that. I, I don't know what happened. Yeah, okay, right. Uh, go go back. Okay. Um, what was covered in the uh, first webinar, uh, we did an overview of the different parts of the webinar. Uh, we looked at uh, some background information on how the guide was developed and the fact that it was the first uh, guide that was developed through the NCHRP process. Uh, all 50 states were involved. We talked a little bit about the relationship of this um, particular guide to other guides that are available, including uh, the MBTCD, uh, the NACTO guides. And then we gave an overall uh, uh, high-level overview of some of the major changes in the two 2012 guide, uh, as well as going chapter by chapter and looking at some of those changes. Uh, next. Um, just uh, by way of interest, uh, since the release of the guide in, in June of 2012, uh, we've sold, uh, they've sold already about 1,200 copies. And I just mentioned the number of the pages here just to give you uh, a sense of how expanded the guide is. It went from 75 pages to over 200 pages and three, cha three chapters to seven chapters. This list will look uh, uh, familiar to you, and uh, this is one of the, uh, uh, I think, really important parts of the new chapter on planning. It talks about why planning for bicycling is important. 
And uh, nothing real surprising here And when you look at the list, but I think what's important about it is that uh, it's in the AASHTO guide. And uh, a lot of times, it's, uh, as, as we all know, it's not what you say, but who says it. And the fact that uh, these things are listed in the guide, it really gives you a menu of things that you can go to to use when you want to uh, create a, uh, say a bicycle master plan, when you want to talk about why it's important to include bicycling in a particular project or program. And uh, it, it really has a rock wide range of ideas here that you can use. So things like economic development, uh, an area that we see a lot of growth in is uh, transit and, and tying bicycling with transit. Uh, public health, uh, I think it's the first time you see that them on the list. And uh, it's been a real welcome addition to the discussion on transportation planning and design and bicycling. So uh, this is a list that you can use, again, when you're justifying why planning for bicycling is important. Next. Again, under the theme of why bicycling, why planning for bicycling is important, um, there's a quite a bit of discussion in here in terms of how bicycle improvements benefit other modes. Uh, one of the one of the themes I think we hear a lot of, and it's a lot of it at times I think it's a bit misguided is that you know, we have to make trade-offs. Are we going to accommodate motor vehicles or are we going to accommodate bicyclists? And you know, sometimes that's true and there is a trade-off, but many, many times there's not. In fact, uh, probably more often than not, there's benefits for everyone. So um, I've just listed a, a few examples here. So um, if you look at the picture here, of course, you're going to see the picture of the motor vehicle lane and the sidewalk, and in this case, the the uh, bike lane really benefits the pedestrians because it provides a buffer between the travel lane and the sidewalk. Uh, another uh, good example would be shoulders. Uh, shoulders uh, have a great benefit, of course, for bicyclists and for walkers in, in rural areas, but they also uh, have a big benefit for motorist safety in terms of a pull off the road or off the road area, place for changing uh, tires. Uh, it also, uh, we'll talk more about this in the final webinar, number seven, about maintenance. But uh, obviously, if you provide a shoulder, the roadway is going to last a lot longer, so you don't have that breaking off on the edge. So uh, I think, that, again, uh, this is a really important new area in the planning guide because it really provides a context to say that uh, when we provide for bicycling, we also benefit all the other modes. Trip purpose. Um, this, this is a, a real interesting discussion that appears in the planning chapter, and it provides a lot of uh, what I'm just going to call nuanced discussion. Uh, if you look at the, the bullet points uh, underneath utilitarian versus recreation, uh, first of all, it defines you know, utilitarian, uh, uh, non-discretionary types of trips, and then recreational, uh, discretionary kinds of trips. But it has a good discussion that points out that it's difficult to differentiate between the two types of trips and uh, the fact that a lot of trips are a combination, partly utilitarian, partly recreational. And then this last uh, point here at the bottom of the slide you see, I think this is really the takeaway here, is that regardless of the type of trip, in other words, regardless of why people are uh, riding their bicycle, it doesn't change the, the design of the facility. In other words, um, the width of a bike lane doesn't change depending on whether it's utilitarian or recreational, or the width or the design speed of a, a trail doesn't change depending on, on why people are using it. So uh, I think this is a really good discussion. It's more nuanced, and I think it provides some really good direction and, and things that, again, you can use. Next. Again, here's another area, and this is uh, new guidance, and, and I think this is particularly useful. It talks about the types of bicycle, the bicycling and bicyclists, and it talks about three kinds of uh, cyclists, uh, age, children cyclists, and you can just see the images here. I've got the three different images with the three different kinds of cyclists. Uh, experienced and confident, and you see the gentleman in the lower right on a two-lane ro uh, country road, and then the casual and less confident. And, um, the, the takeaway here and why this is important is, is it, it doesn't change how you design a facility, like I mentioned before, but what it does do 
is it allows you to target certain audiences or certain end users, and it allows you to then focus on saying, um, get a little jumping around here. <laughs> um, oops, we got to go um, one more forward, one more there. There you go. Thanks. Um, it allows you to then uh, set priorities. So, for example, we know that uh, the majority of people in most communities who own bicycles and may do some bicycling are going to be the casual and less competent. They own a bike. They don't use it a lot. So when we start doing planning and prioritization, uh, we may want to target this kind of cycles. So it really provides, again, a good way of doing planning, setting priorities, and moving forward. Next. There's a couple charts in the planning chapter that I think are particularly good, and um, I just put in a couple examples here. So uh, this is taken directly from the guide, uh, and it talks about the casual, less confident riders, the fact that they may prefer share-use paths, bicycle boulevards, bike lanes, low-volume streets. And so when you know this, and if you know most of the bicyclists in your community are going to be the casual, less confident, maybe it gives you direction, for example, to say that uh, you want to focus, first of all, say, on doing some bike boulevards, which are relatively low cost and are going to meet this particular target group. Again, it doesn't change the design, but it may change what you decide to do uh, in the short term and your short term in the first priorities. Next is another example of the types of bicycling, bicycling and bicyclists, again, guidance. Uh, the first one was one on more of the novice rider. Uh, this one talks about the more experienced and confident riders. I'm not going to read you all this, but I think it's just important to know that there's different guidance for different kinds of riders, and again, it's going to help you a lot with your planning. Next. Did you go to the next? Okay. This is uh, some, again, very, very good guidance. Whoops, uh, go back one. Okay, this is some guidance on the uh, transportation planning process. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna run through these here in a minute, but the, the overall theme here is that uh, bicycling needs to be included in all transportation uh, planning, whether it be a plan, whether it be a project, whether it be a program. And so uh, first one listed here, there's uh, all different kinds of plans. You have transportation plans, recreation plans. There's also open space, greenway plans, a lot of different plans. And the messaging here is that uh, bicycles need to be included in all the different kinds of plans that are done. Some are going to be local. Some are going to be regional. Some are going to be statewide. Uh, but uh, bicycling, uh, bicycles are to be an integral part of that. And then it goes on to talk specifically, more specifically, about bicycle master plans. And um, it, it gives some really good guidance on what should be in the plan, typical plan uh, contents, uh, some guidance on public process and how that's important to creating buy-in to the plan. Uh, this, the second point here uh, under bicycle master plans, I think, is particularly important, coordination with other plans. In other words, Bicycle plans are not intended to be totally isolated, but they need to work with other plans. They need to work with other modes like uh, freight mobility or transit or whatever the case may be. Um, and then, of course, it talks about uh, phasing. And uh, I'll have another image on that. So it really gives you a good sense of the basics of what should be in a bike, bike master plan. And then it goes on to identify some other kinds of planning. And it's not intended necessarily to be an exhaustive list, but what it does do is it gives you some really good ideas, uh, again, of incorporating bicycling into what's happening. Uh, quite often nowadays in bigger projects, we're having uh, traffic impact studies done or, or a traffic analysis done, say, if you're looking at a new signal. What it's suggesting here is when you do those analysis, and it, uh, you include bikes. Uh, an example would be you're putting in a new subdivision and you need to be able to have connectivity through that subdivision. Or maybe there's a trail that's already there that will go through the subdivision, a new road going in. You need to look at that. So it's really suggesting that uh, both existing bike facilities and future bicycle facility needs be included in the discussion when you're looking at impact in traffic studies. 
small area and corridor level, level, level planning. Uh, frequently, we may focus on a small area uh, for a study. For example, it may be uh, an area that uh, has a lot of density or crashes. And what it's suggesting is when you do those uh, small area plans, again, bicycling needs to be part of that. Uh, more and more popular are corridor level planning. Uh, may look at a whole corridor for uh, reducing crashes, improving transit. Bikes need to be part of that discussion. So when we do corridor plans and focus plans, and that could be both a facility part and, say, an outreach uh, education part, bikes need to be part of that, that planning and that discussion. And then project level planning. And this is more of the traditional capital improvement project. You're putting a new bridge. You're putting a new roadway, uh, something like that. And it suggests that, again, when you're doing this, bikes need to be part of that planning. So again, the overall take-home takeaway message on this is lots of different plans out there, lots of different um, ways of approaching it, different in different communities, but in all cases, uh, bicycles need to be part of the part of the uh, discussion, part of the planning, and then institutionalized, if you will, into the infrastructure that's being built. Next. So um, just uh, sort of a, a summary slide here then of some of the key things and the themes that go into the planning chapter. Again, bicycles need accommodation on all roadways and all plans, as I was just talking about. Uh, again, it, it, it focuses throughout the chapter on deciding and prioritizing where improvements are needed. Um, the one thing I haven't emphasized, but I think it's worth it right here, is that it's a very practical approach. Um, uh, there, there's certainly certainly backed up by good research and the latest in the MUTCD and other places, but uh, a very practical approach that I think this makes this readable, workable, and, and usable by both the professional transportation committee, but I think the advocacy committee, uh, community, and others will also find uh, very, very good uh, information in here. And then, and then finally, again, throughout this whole planning chapter, how do you choose what's the appropriate facility? Next image. I alluded to this earlier, but I wanted to spend a little bit of time on this one because I think it's so important. Uh, one of the things it talks about in the planning chapter, and this really falls under the umbrella of being practical, uh, short-term projects, medium-term projects, long-term projects. One of the things that we, we find and know when we're uh, doing implementation of, of uh, bicycle projects and programs is that it's really important to show immediate success and get that momentum, get more bicyclists out there, get over that barrier of saying, you know, if we build it, will they come? Um, and so it really gives you some practical guidance here on, on giving it up into short, medium, and long-term projects. One of my favorite little sayings is, paint is your friend. And you can do a lot with paint, uh, paint and uh, sign. So the example you see in the image on the right of your screen there, uh, there's a road, a street in a, in a uh, neighborhood commercial area. I was just repaved, and they did a road diet on it. In other words, they reduced the number of lanes and added the bike lane. And this was done as right after the repaving. So when a street re gets repaved, obviously it has to be repainted, and that can be an easy to implement uh, restriping uh, project that can occur right at that time. Um, Medium-term projects would be probably a little more expensive, something like widening a shoulder. It might be something like putting in a bulb out. Um, it might be something like um, putting in a new signal or, say, rebuilding a signal, but quite often that's, that's more common uh, to accommodate bicycles through there. And then, so it takes some more money, a little more planning, you quite often a capital project, but again, it's, it's sort of medium term and then uh, long term projects. And those would be you know, really complex, high cost, uh, a bridge. It could be a bike bridge or it could be part of a, another bridge project which accommodates bikes. And I think the key here in terms of not only being practical, it also is really an implementation strategy. And the suggestion here is that you need to be doing all three of these at once, uh, but don't just to jump to the long-term projects, really start making the change right away. So again, very practical, very doable, usable. Uh, it's a really good guidance. Uh, next. Mm -hmm. 
When you're uh, doing the phasing, it also gives you some guidance on issues to consider. And uh, uh, again, uh, not rocket science, not stuff you haven't seen before, but again, very, very good guidance. And I think if used correctly, you're really going to get you know, better outcomes. Uh, one of the ways I like to describe it is we have two scarce resources, our time and our money, and um, we want to use them smartly and use them to the best uh, possible advantage. And so uh, some of the guidance here, again, I did not list all of them, but just to give you a sense of some of the things that are covered in here, obviously bicycle travel demand. You want to focus on those areas that are going to get used, um, and that's an important uh, consideration to give you permission then to do other kinds of, of um, improvements. Uh, connectivity, we've, again, um, nothing new here, but suggesting that when you have systems, you want them connected and so that you can get where you want to go. Uh, directness, uh, cyclists typically are going to be no different than motorists or anyone else who want to directly go to their destination. Uh, crash conflict analysis. I'm not going to say a lot about this because we're going to cover this on another slide right, later on. But what it does suggest is that, again, when you are considering what should be sort of near-term uh, improvements, you want to look at crash data and focus on those high crash locations and corridors. Barriers. Um, every community is going to have some barriers. That could be a freeway. It could be a river. It could be a railroad track. It could be a lake. There's a lot of different things that can cause barriers. And uh, it talks about including that in the discussion about addressing those barriers in terms of creating connectivity and making the whole system work. Ease of implementation. Uh, again, this gets to the practical part. Uh, you want to think in terms of cost. Uh, do you need to buy right of way? Uh, is there an easier way to do it? Is there an alternative route? Um, it's not suggesting you shouldn't do some of those expensive things, but it suggests that that don't jump there right away and, and get going early, early implementation and, and make sure it's practical. And then system integration is a really important part. Uh, again, it gets back to the theme that bicycling doesn't exist in isolation. It needs to be part of other systems, systems like transit, freight mobility, uh, other systems that you may have in your community, uh, walking systems. And so it really needs to be not only uh, something you look at independently, but something that, that really uh, works for the whole system. And like I said before, works for benefits for all modes. And that, that really is one of the keys. Next. OK, um, I, I mentioned this a couple times, and this flushes that out a little bit more deciding where improvements are needed. Um, again, bicyclists need to be accommodated in all roadways. And then the guide goes on to explain um, how do you figure out where improvements are needed. And it goes back to uh, the points I raised earlier uh, in terms of being practical, um, in terms of, of really focusing on those things that are going to uh, really get the most bicycling and create a, a good network. Um, the other couple things that are, and I'll have another image on this, but a couple of other new areas that are addressed here is uh, multiple facilities on a single corridor. And there, it discusses when and where that may be appropriate. Uh, there are situations where, for example, you might want a, uh, a side path and bike lanes at the same place. or a one-way street where you have a through bike lane on the right side and then a bike lane on the left side for turning left, something like that. So it gives some examples and talks about that. And again, I think the key here is that it, it gives you some guidelines for making good planning decisions and it gives you permission to do this where needed. And then finally, wayfinding. Uh, and I'll have another, we'll have another image on that, but it provides really good wayfinding guidance based on the 2009 uh, METCD. Next. So um, I'm going to, I had talked about um, deciding um, you know, uh, where improvements are made. And then in a moment here, we're going to talk about what improvements are, are made. So uh, this will be my last slide. And then I'm going to turn it over to, to uh, RJ. Um, but when you look, again, this is just a more detailed guidance on where improvements are made. and. Um, uh, Again, I didn't even pick them all, but it really gives you a, a good list, if you will. Uh, and not all of these are going to be applicable to every jurisdiction. But 
uh, you get to use the list. It's, it, it's in the AASHTO guide and use the ones that are appropriate for your community. So again, the first one I think there is really important that you need to build to the needs of all types of users and that gets back to the earlier slide of, you know, who are the bicyclists? Uh, we have to get a talk about barriers. And there's some good discussion here on connection to land use. Uh, the little image on the right here uh, shows employment centers and it's just one of the things that you may want to consider. Um, you might also want to consider transit stops, for example, but not every community has that. So uh, again, you're going to customize this to your local community. Uh, directness, directness, directness of route, uh, intersections, that's a really important one. We know that most bike crashes occur at intersections, so that becomes you know, part of the consideration of where you want improvements. Um, I like the one on aesthetics here. One of the things we know from an economic development point of view is that people and companies are increasingly mobile. People want to be uh, uh, live and do business in communities that have uh, aesthetic amenities, and so that becomes more and more uh, of an important part of the discussion and in the de uh, end of the design. Uh, spacing or density of bikeways. Uh, not all this isn't an issue for all communities where you may have a lot of topography, but uh, where you have uh, opportunities to more of a grid system, and you have opportunities to make a decision about how frequent you want uh, bikeways. We have a good discussion in, in the new guide about spacing and density and how you might approach it. And then obviously uh, safety, we've talked about that already. Uh, some issues related to personal security, lighting, talk a little bit about that more later. And then again, overall feasibility, getting back to the practical side. Next. So choosing an appropriate facility, and at this point I'm going to turn it over to RJ. We talked about figuring out where you need bike facilities, and then the next logical step is choosing a facility. So uh, RJ? Thanks, Pete. Um, yeah, as Peter said, uh, one of the most important things after you've figured out where uh, the improvements are needed is really getting down to what sorts of uh, facilities are most appropriate. And in this area, the guide has uh, a lot of detailed guidance on different types of bicycle facilities. And um, but the new things here is it provides a lot of um, information and detail on the different criteria, these considerations on the right-hand side of your screen that should be considered when uh, deciding on the appropriate facility. Um, and this is a pretty significant advancement from the previous guide. Uh, in, in the earlier version, it really emphasized the anticipated user type so that um, advanced beginner or child cyclist, um, but now it's incorporating not only that, but lots of other features such as the road classification, uh, traffic volume, um, road conditions, driveway, parking, etc. And um, it's really, I think this is this is very important because it gives the uh, planners and designers um, a much bigger um, toolbox to work with. Um, also included in this section is an important um, acknowledgement that in urban centers in the, in the U.S. Uh, that are experiencing the highest levels of bicycle use, um, those places have an extensive network of um, designated bicycle facilities such as bike lanes and, and um, shared use paths. So again, getting to this um, idea that if you really want to attract the uh, the large majority of users, you need to have designated facilities. Um, the uh, I, I, the type A or advanced cyclist um, may be comfortable in lots of situations, but won't that won't be necessarily true for everyone else. Next slide, please. Um, so there's a I think three and a half pages actually of charts on the different types of um, bicycle facilities and um, detailed considerations on the different facility types. And one of the first things that this section talks about is um, it's something that Pete mentioned earlier, the um, importance of considering multiple facility types on the same corridor. And these may be um, different facilities running in parallel, but it also may be a, a string, if you will, of, of different facilities that are kind of linked together to form a, uh, a route. And one of the important things here is really the transition between these facilities. They need to be uh, very functional, high quality, and intuitive so that 
riders know when to expect them and understand uh, easily how to navigate in between the different um, facility types. So I'm going to use in this chart right here, um, just we have uh, def several different considerations. I was going to use the bike lanes example. And here we have a description of the, uh, the where bike lanes are most appropriate. And in here we see it's um, providing direct access to major land uses and also on collector roadways and busy urban streets. And also it looks at the motor vehicle design speed. Again, this is something new and uh, an improvement over the previous uh, version of this guide. Um, and addresses traffic volume and the roadway classification. And um, lastly, each one of these different facility types has a detailed discussion on other considerations. Uh, for bike lanes, um, motor vehicle parking is very important to look at. Also, intersections and uh, driveway spacing and design are, again, very important considerations and must be handled very carefully um, when designing um, bicycle facilities. Now, one of the, the uh, things that I want to point out in this chapter, it's really kind of an overview of the different facility types and gives some fundamental considerations. There's, as Pete mentioned, and you'll hear me say again in, in, on some other slides, there's a lot more detail in the actual design chapters that you'll hear about on upcoming webinars. Next slide, please. And one more click. OK. Um, here in Chapter 2, we talk about some of the overarching considerations for wayfinding. Oh, uh, just back one. Um, and with some of the additional technical details being in um, Chapter 4 of this guide, as well as a Part 9 of the METCD. But this is really just a, uh, I would say, at the macro level discussion of uh, wayfinding principles, if you will. Um, for instance, the guide um, mentions that if, when developing a wayfinding plan, um, designers and planners really need to consider the importance of balancing the need for good cycling conditions with the need for direct access to destinations. So the uh, most direct route, which may be preferred by uh, some cyclists, may not necessarily be the best route to provide your wayfinding on it. So it really is, it's a, it's a very nuanced approach. And there's seven or eight different considerations here um, for wayfinding. Other considerations um, really emphasize the importance of conducting field work. Again, this helps you identify the most effective routes, the most logical routes, and also the most logical sign placement locations. Like, I'm sure everyone who's on the call has uh, dozens of examples where they've seen signs that are placed in locations that don't make sense, or similarly, um, routes where an additional sign would be a tremendous benefit because there's a gap in the, uh, the sort of the, the network and it's sometimes hard to figure out uh, your way from point A to point B. Um, but one of the, I guess, the fundamental principles is really starting with a simple um, plan. Start small and then really approach it with an eye to building the network over time. Next slide, please. Okay, the, uh, the next section of the guide discusses um, several different data uh, technical analysis tools that are very useful in bicycle planning and design. And uh, we're going to go over um, six of these in a little bit more detail on, on upcoming slides. But I guess generally an introduction, just an acknowledgement that these are very useful and important in managing the large quantities of data and information that's often a part of a bicycle um, planning exercise. And it's also, these tools also provide, um, they can be very helpful in helping to convey this often complex and sometimes arcane information to the community, to elected officials, and to stakeholders who must, they need to be brought along, they need to be part of the process, and they need to understand at a certain level sort of where we're going with this plan. Next slide, please. Okay, so the first one is um, data collection and flow analysis. And um, really, bike data collection is it's a critical part of understanding and um, planning the, the bicycle network. And there's lots and lots of different ways that data is used in um, bicycle facility planning. 
you know, this list right here identifies several of them. I'm sure there are several others that people are using counts for. And one of the very exciting things about this is this is a field that's evolving very quickly right now. There are new technologies coming on all the time to assist in counting. There are new approaches um, that are supplementing the, um, the uh, practices that have been in place for some time now. And, uh, and I just think that there's tremendous opportunities in this area um, for communities. But um, I guess one of the important recommendations here in the guide is consideration that counts need to happen at the state, regional, and local level. And there's a variety of different reasons that you'll do counts. Um, or these different levels will, will perform counts. And subsequently, the, the methodology or the approach really needs to be tailored to the use. Uh, the, the guide does not go into the nuts and bolts of how to administer bicycle counts. I want to make sure that that's clear to uh, everybody on the, um, on the line. Really, it um, really provides an overview of how it can be used in, um, in planning and design. Next slide, please. OK, uh, so um, quality of service, a level of service um, tools, something that's uh, been around for several years now. And I think most people are familiar with this as the valuation tool for um, gauging a typical bicyclist, bicyclist's um, sense of safety and comfort on a uh, given uh, bicycle facility. And there's on-road um, bicycle level of service or quality of service tools. And then there's the off-road shared use path level of service. And for the purpose of this discussion, I'm going to focus on the on-road um, piece. Um, but factors influencing the score um, are, include uh, traffic speed, separation from vehicles, um, and the uh, volume of traffic, uh, as well as just the type of facility that you're on. And one of the great ways that, or several actually great ways that these level of service tools can be very useful for bicycle planning. Uh, Region-wide, you can run it to identify roadways that are um, better or, or worse for bicycling, and then use those to prioritize your investments. On a more localized or site-specific um, level, you can use uh, these level of service tools to evaluate different alternatives. So to really, before you spend a lot of uh, time and money and energy on design or even construction, you can um, get a snapshot or a good quick understanding of what the impacts are going to be on bicycling of various roadway configurations. Uh, next slide, please. Um, Safety analysis and crash analysis. This is a, uh, a section of the guide where there's been a significant amount of additional information. And I think it's one of the more important sections of the, uh, the whole guide. And really, it's an acknowledgment that, that the um, analysis and understanding and use of crash data is, can be very helpful and very useful for improving safety, um, improving uh, increasing the numbers of people who will be riding and helping you to prioritize where you want to focus your investments. Um, so the, the guide, again, it doesn't go into great detail on how to conduct a crash uh, data analysis. There's several different approaches to this. But it talks about some of the ways that it can be used and some of the limitations with crash data that you really need to be considering when um, undertaking one of these undertakings. For instance, um, it's important to review at least three years of data and um, acknowledge that bike crashes often tend to be um, underreported. And those that do go reported are generally crashes with motor vehicles or crashes where you have uh, significant uh, injuries. Um, similarly, you know, there's uh, a lot of people, they focus just on the, the crash number, but that doesn't tell the whole story. It's important to combine this with uh, count data so that you have a better understanding of the, cr the crash rate. That's when you can really start to focus in on the areas where you have the highest exposure and, um, and prioritize your, your investments on things that are going to have the, the biggest bang for the buck, so to speak. 
Um, there are some tools out there now uh, that are discussed in the guide. For instance, the uh, Federal Highways Pedestrian and Bicycle Crash Analysis tool that's available on the PBIC website is a um, it's a good tool for um, compiling crash data and and analyzing uh, this information to figure out recommended uh, countermeasures for different types of crashes. And also, it can help you um, target specific geographic locations where um, uh, treatments are necessary. Next slide, please. Um, a GIS data collection. I feel like this is something that could occupy three <laughs> uh, or four different webinars. And so I'll just uh, address this fairly quickly. There's so many different ways that GIS is becoming a fundamental part of uh, bicycle network planning and also more localized planning. Um, but a few key ways that it can be used. It's a very, very powerful tool for compiling complex data sets and lots of different types of information into clear, easy to understand visual um, tools or graphics that, again, can be sh shared with uh, stakeholders, with the public, with the community and provide meaning to lots of numbers, data, and um, different pieces of information. It's also just a great white way to organize information into a way that the um, planning professionals, design professionals can use to conduct various types of analysis. And it's uh, essential for bicycle level of service, crash analysis, um, some types of demand analysis that I'll get into a little bit. So um, again, it's, I, it's area that has a lot of potential and a lot of need in the um, bicycle planning profession. Next slide, please. OK, um, demand analysis. And uh, this is an important way of understanding where uh, facilities are needed. Um, he talked about this a little bit in his, towards the end of his presentation. And it can really help you inform the prioritization process that's, so that you're focusing your energies, whether it's early on in the, uh, if you have limited uh, resources for field work, it can help you focus on target areas for your field work. Uh, or if it's later on in the planning process and you're trying to figure out where to focus infrastructure investments. Uh, again, bicycle uh, travel demand can be very, very helpful. and in this um, arena. And it's important to not just look at um, the existing demand, the, the current cyclists are out there. You really need to consider latent demand. Uh, this, uh, oftentimes, you hear the argument, well, nobody's going to ride here, um, or nobody would ever ride here. And of course, if there's no facility, you know, many people may choose not to. But there could be pent up demand for that connection or for that particular stretch of uh, roadway. So uh, demand analysis can incorporate um, land use, census data, lots of different pieces of information. And using GIS tools, you can, and can actually figure out where you have clusters of demand. And there's lots of different types of uh, demand analysis. And some of these are listed here. Um, and I don't think I need to go into much more detail on these, but these are described in the guide. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, OK, cost-benefit analyses are, um, again, this is an area that I think is emerging very quickly. It's uh, long, I think it's a long history in motor vehicle planning and design and uh, has recent, is starting to come into its own in bicycle facility um, planning and design. And it really looks at the upfront capital costs as well as the ongoing um, capital costs when you're calculating the cost. And there's lots of different ways to calculate benefits. Um, there are, uh, the, the guide discusses at a kind of a high level some of the different considerations that should go into a cost-benefit analysis, but again, does not um, prescribe a specific method for conducting one of these studies. Um, I think that this is largely done in the recognition that this is a, is a field that it's seemingly every month there's new studies, new research coming out 
that's providing more information um, that helps enrich in this uh, particular area. Um, but one of the most important things, again, sort of the takeaway from this, is it can really help you compare the uh, benefit or the investments in motor vehicle and transit projects to um, bicycle projects. So it kind of puts, um, it brings a level playing field to the uh, discussion here. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, as, as Pete mentioned earlier, one of the areas that we're seeing a lot of um, growth and interest in is bicycle integration with transit. And uh, there's several reasons why this is becoming important. And there are more people moving to urbanized areas where you have expensive transit systems, uh, also with uh, increases in fuel prices and people living perhaps longer distances from their employment. Uh, if they're still interested in cycling, they're, they're looking for ways to um, incorporate bicycling as part of their trip, but maybe not the whole trip. Um, similarly, you could have uh, personal security concerns, weather, topography, lots of different reasons. Uh, but one of the key factors that goes into people's considerations when they're thinking about this is, how easy is it going to be for me to get onto the, the bus or onto the subway? if um, I'm going to be taking transit. And so the, the very first and the, perhaps the most important consideration is that connection, that bikeway connection to the transit stop or to the transit station. And the guide discusses sort of why that's important and some of the considerations for that. And then there's these other considerations. Uh, once you get there, can you bring your um, bike on the transit vehicle? In many cases, you may be able to, but there, there are certain circumstances where you can. And so bike parking um, becomes very important. And a lot of urbanized or transit system in, in highly urbanized areas that are experiencing capacity constraints uh, just with the sheer number of riders are really focusing energies on um, new and innovative bike parking uh, techniques to enable them to, uh, to serve these, these riders. They're very interested in it because it's more riders for them, but it's not more parking. They don't want to be in the, uh, the motor vehicle parking business. And it's, um, you know, relatively speaking, it's much, much cheaper to build bike parking than um, car parking. Um, one of the other things the guy talks about is the uh, uh, addressing the combined bicycle and bus transit, or bicycle and transit facilities. So these are maybe bike bus lanes or bike lanes on uh, high bus court, highly used bus corridors, and it uh, provides some of the considerations and some guidance when you are dealing with one of these situations. Uh, for instance, it may it discusses um, putting bike lanes on the opposite side of the street. Uh, if you have a one-way street on the opposite, or a counterflow bike lane, perhaps, I'm sorry, not counterflow, a uh, bike lane on the opposite side of the street, if you have um, buses on the right side that have frequent stops, and different strategies to help uh, minimize conflicts and sort of manage that interface between the bike and the bus. Um, next slide, please. We're going to do a little, this is a little bonus because it uh, looks like chapter three is not going to be covered in full on one of these webinars. And chapter three is actually, um, the, the old chapter two in the, in the previous guide has been divided into chapter two and chapter three. And so each of these go into significantly more detail on the topics included. Um, and Chapter two is more on the planning side, and three is really more on the bicycle operation characteristics and has a heavy emphasis on safety. Um, so one of the great things in here, new for, for this guide, is a detailed discussion on the design vehicle. And it's not just the um, standard bicycle, but it also gets into um, bicycles with trailers, bikes with trailer bikes for children, uh, recumbent bicycles, tandem bicycles, and includes characteristics such as the, um, the length that should be considered of the vehicle dimensions, um, speeds of these, and acceleration and deceleration rates of the various types of um, vehicles. And um, 
Then it also gets it discusses traffic principles for cyclists, and uh, I think this is this is a very important section because really when people are planning and designing these facilities, they need to understand the proper way they're to be used and, and how people use these facilities. So when presented with challenging situations, it can help them anticipate um, how a cyclist may be using it. Um, this knowledge is going to be very helpful in the, um, improving the design process and also the actual rider's experience once the facility is built. Okay, so next slide, please. Um, this chapter goes into a lot of a significant more amount of detail on crash studies. And uh, the first part of this discussion, it's kind of a synthesis of several different crash studies that have been conducted over the um, past 10 or so years. But um, one of the more important things here is just an understanding of how uh, common causes of crashes in different contexts, so urban and rural contexts, or nighttime versus daytime. And also, common crashes amongst different user groups, um, youth, advanced cyclists, et cetera. Um, next slide, please. And uh, lastly, it discusses some of the most common um, bicyclist and motor vehicle crashes, sort of what some of the, the major or dominant uh, occurrences are. And it provides countermeasures, both uh, engineering countermeasures as well as programmatic you know, education enforcement countermeasures uh, to help uh, address some of these different issues. Um, so next slide please. All right, so uh, just in closing I guess there's a lot of great information on um, facility planning in, in the new AASHTO guide and I really encourage everybody out there who hasn't already done so to take advantage of AASHTO's uh, 20% discount to get your own copy. And also, I just wanted to say thank you to uh, Federal Highway Administration, AASHTO, and the Pedestrian Bicycle Information Center, and UNC's Highway Safety Research Center uh, for putting on this series. I think it's very helpful. Uh, back to you. Jane. Thank you, Peter, and thank you, RJ. Uh, now we have some time for some questions. Uh, I believe that Jennifer Tool, principal at Tool Design Group, will be joining us to answer questions as well. Uh, if you've not already done so, please enter your questions into the box on your screen. Uh, because this is part of a larger series exploring the new bike guide, we will try to limit questions to topics covered only in this webinar. Again, if we run out of time for your question, we'll attempt to answer it and get back to you after the program. Uh, so the first question I got is, uh, could you describe a little bit to me what bike boulevards are? Yeah, this is Pete. Why don't I uh, start with that one? And in in general, uh, and I think uh, we alluded this to this in the presentation, uh, bike boulevards are focused on the less uh, providing opportunity for less experienced cyclists to use roads typically that are going to be more residential in nature, uh, a lower volume. Uh, there's uh, a lot of communities are are putting these together. There's there's two issues that tend to need to be addressed uh, when doing bike boulevards is one is just the continuity, connectivity. A lot of times there's you know, what we refer to as super blocks. You might have a major road every half mile or mile. And uh, some of the subdivisions don't always have connectivity through that allow you to get through those subdivisions. So that's the first issue. And then uh, every once in a while, you're going to hit a really busy wide road. And you need to be able to get across the road. So, um, uh, so what's addressed in the guide is, is focusing on some of those issues. And then it also gives you a really nice shopping list of, of uh, things that you can do to, to facilitate making the bike boulevard work. So some of them are some of the traditional traffic calming kinds of things that would just manage the speed of the traffic. And then it also provides some ideas on diversion. In other words, uh, can you create a street that uh, is a through street for the bicyclist? You can zip right through but it's not going to necessarily encourage more motor vehicle traffic that are using it as a cut through. So that's the real short version of that. OK. Uh, one of the slides mentioned that bikes must be accommodated on all roadways. Does that include limited access principal arterials and interstates? 
I, I'll start with that, and then uh, maybe one of my colleagues want to uh, respond to that too. What the guide does is it provides um, uh, some really good guidance, for example, on uh, bicycles on interstates. And it's not saying that bikes need to be on all interstates, uh, but what it, it does is it acknowledges when and where it may be appropriate on interstates and uh, talks about some of the design considerations. For example, if you're in a really urbanized area that has a lot of on and off, off ramps and there's, there's alternative routes, you know, parallel routes on the ground next to the freeway, that may not be the best place to consider allowing the bike on the freeway. On the other hand, if you're in, say, a mountainous region, there's one pass and the only way you can get through, that might be a very, very good candidate. So on the areas of, free, of freeways, it, it uh, gives you that more nuanced guidance. Uh, in the areas of other roads, it does say, yes, you know, you should consider bikes on all roadways. Uh, that doesn't say that, not to say that bikes, um, quite often that there's other alternatives and considerations, but it, it does say that you need to address it in everything you're doing. I, I guess I would just add that um, you know there are places where it's explicitly prohibited. So in those areas, um, you know you you would not have to. But one of the other things that's important for people to consider is crossings, whether it's a uh, overpass or an underpass, and making sure that cyclists are um, included and considered in those connections because. There are cases where that can be one of the biggest barriers is just getting across the uh, the interstate. Okay, uh, how do you measure demand on a facility that's not yet been built? Um, this is a, uh, I guess I would say one of the emerging areas of analysis. There are some tools. PBIC actually has a um, as part of their cost benefit analysis tool that's on their website, it uh, provides some estimates of demand, um, but uh, I would say that it probably should be looked at uh, with an eye to, to making sure that you're localizing the information and really making sure that it's tailored to your specific situation. Uh, but it's, it's just an area that I think we're going to see a lot of advances in over the next few years. Okay. Uh, is reducing motor vehicle speed a tool for bike planning? Yeah. Uh, um, yes, I think uh, reducing motor vehicle speed, it opens up potentially a lot of different options. Uh, there are certain facility types that may become more appropriate with uh, lower speeds. Obviously, it addresses people's perceptions of safety and comfort on a specific facility. and. Um, it, uh, yeah. Yeah, and I'll just add to that that um, the chapter on uh, on chapter four on on-road facility design has an entire section on traffic calming and traffic management as tools to to provide for bicycling, and and um, discusses how to make sure that when you use um, traffic calming or traffic management that you you use bicycle-friendly strategies. So yes, it's definitely a tool. Does the current BLOS methodology account for shared lane markings? Uh, not that I am aware of, no. And following up on, on that, um, in terms of prioritizing routes based on LOS, is it better to go from an F to a C? or a C to an A? I suppose I would say that depends on what your goals are, but um, an F is not going to be comfortable for, I, I shouldn't say anyone, but only the most hardy cyclists are going to be comfortable on an F. Uh, so I think you want to figure out what your community's goals are and if it's to improve the baseline across the board, then probably go from an F to a C. If that C to an A is very important for a wide range of users, then that would be the area that I would focus. 
Yeah, I really think it has to be done in context with all the other factors that we discussed uh, throughout the webinar in terms of is it going to get used, what's the demand, who's the target audience, those kinds of things. And, and if a person wanted to learn more about the LOS equation, where might they turn to, to find information on that? Um, so the, the bike guide refers to the Highway Capacity Manual. That's where you can get um, all of the technical detail on how to, to, to use that modeling technique um, and, and what it's used for. Um, so that's, that's where I would go for more information on bicycle level service, also pedestrian level service. And transit level service is covered by um, the Highway Capacity Manual now. Should the implementation of on-street bicycle lanes be considered a formal traffic calming measure, or is it more appropriate to consider that a secondary benefit to a roadway section? Um, I'll, I'll just start with that. I, I don't think that, that that's addressed directly uh, addressed in the guide, um, but I, I think that uh, in general, um, putting in a bike lane to accomplish something else like traffic calming, if it's not part of a system, doesn't provide connectivity, uh, probably is not the right place to start. Um, certainly, some amount of traffic calming can be a benefit of putting in a bike lane, especially if it's combined with, say, doing a road diet, reducing the number of lanes. But um, there's nothing in the guide that suggests that you should sort of lead with that question. Could you please expand on the safety issues related to on-street versus off-street side paths slash sidewalks? And are there any resources that you'd recommend on this topic? Well, I, I'm, I'll start with that one. Um, it's probably a, a false choice. It isn't deciding which one is safer. Um, you know, the right answer is it depends. And there's places where the most appropriate solution is going to be a side path. Uh, or maybe a, a shared use path that's not it's in its own right of way. Uh, other times, the best solution is going to be uh, on the street, and it's really context uh, sensitive, and it's really why we have the whole planning chapter. It's not to make that call one way or the other, but it's to give you the tools to make that call. Yeah, and I'll just add that the the bike guide has the Astro bike guide has quite a bit of discussion. Uh, on the operational issues with paths that are adjacent to the road. Um, it talks about, especially about intersection design. And you know, the, when you're evaluating what the right design treatment is, intersections become very important, um, especially if you have high speed um, and heavy turning traffic. Um, you would need to focus attention on um, the intersections, regardless of whether you're providing an on-street facility like a bike lane or an off-street facility like a side path. So, um, so there's quite a bit of information in the guide on all the, the pros and cons of both approaches. Okay, I'm getting some messages that the link for the discount PDF is not working. I will, I will go and fix that after uh, the webinar is over. Uh, for everyone who's commented on that so far. Um, going back to our Q&A, uh, is it possible to determine a level of service for roadways without facilities where riding exists? Uh, yes, the bicycle level of service um, tool does allow you to perform that analysis. Okay, in terms of the safety case studies in Chapter 3, are there any comparisons between the effects of intersection forms on cycling safety, such as cycling accident rates for cross intersection versus roundabouts versus signals? You know, it doesn't. It doesn't compare those. I, again, I think that's a bit of a, a, a false choice. What it does do is it gives you, and this gets into other chapters in the guide. It gets into guidance as to when it's a when it's appropriate to have different kinds of facilities, and then once you choose a facility, how do you make it safe? And so, you know, the example of the roundabout, there's really good guidance in there, for example, on a bike lane approaching uh, a roundabout 
and then how you bring it through the roundabout, options for keeping cyclists in the roundabout, bringing them off the roundabout, pros and cons, uh, when you do one, when you do the other. Uh, there's a lot of uh, guidance in there on intersection design, crossings. Um, there's new guidance in there not only on signalization and the geometrics of the intersection, but also uh, based on some of the latest research of the University of North Carolina's Highway Safety Research Center on mark crosswalks at uncontrolled locations, when it's appropriate, where it's not appropriate, how do you do it? So again, it's, it's not going to give you a cookie cutter answer and say, okay, pick this facility. It's going to give you guidance on when and where and why a certain facility might be appropriate. And then once you select a facility, it gives you guidance on how can you best design it to make it work for bicycling and, and really all modes. Does bike LOS need to be an A to attract casual or youth bicyclists? And does the, the bike LOS equate to potential user type? Oh, that's a great question. Um, well, first, first, the second part of the question, does it equate to a user type? No, it does not. Um, the model is actually was, was calibrated using bicyclists of all different types. Um, people who ride every day and people who ride once a year. So, um, so it's really just a, a, a combination of the the the, um, the feeling of comfort of lots of different types of, of bicyclists. Um, and the first part of the question, which I'm forgetting oh, now, the, the type A. The, uh, I would say that. <clears throat> A type or a, or a score of level of service A on a facility um, is not necessarily uh, necessary to attract a, a child or a young user or a beginner user. Um, again, a lot of it depends on other uh, characteristics, and uh, sometimes the just the it may be important for that link to. Um, that may be an important link on an overall network, like let's say it's an off-road system and there's an on-road component. Um, people may elect to use it if it's a short experience, but if it's much longer or if it's the whole ride is B or C and they don't feel comfortable with it, they may decide not to come back and use it again. I, I would just add one, one thought to this too, is that you know we've had a fair number of questions about level of service. and. If you look at the new Bike Astro Guide, well, it certainly covers uh, level of service. Uh, it's in the context of a whole bunch of other things you look at. And it obviously, it refers you to the Highway Capacity Manual. Um, and, and the point there I think it makes, which is important to keep in mind, is we're really talking about level of comfort, not necessarily level of safety. And uh, it's, again, it's more nuanced than that. You can have a high level of comfort, but not necessarily be the safest facility in, in, in town, and vice versa. So again, uh, the level of service is something that's in the guide. Um, it's a great tool, uh, but it's one of a number of things you need to look at. OK. Um, if a route cannot be direct, what's a reasonable diversion? 20%? You know, uh, I'll just take that from a, uh, I'll, I'll do this once here, uh, from a Seattle perspective where we have a lot of top, uh, topography and a lot of lakes and a lot of rivers. And the answer is, uh, it depends. If you have a bridge and it's the only way to get across a river, um, people will go quite a ways out of their way to, to get there because it is the only option. Um, where you have a lot of choices, um, and uh, that goes back to one of the slides I presented in terms of you know, frequency of facility, there's going to be situations where people will not want to go out of their way at all. Uh, for example, you may have a, a one-way street. And uh, if you have to even go a block out of your way and to do that block, so you have to go up a really steep hill, it's got a 15% grade, most cyclists may you say, well, I'm just going to go the wrong way for one block because I don't want to go a block out of my way. So the real answer depends. It's very, very uh, location specific. And I think a principle here that you want to bring to it is, is you know, good, again, good engineering invites right use and good planning invites right use. So um, 
There may be cases, for example, that's why we have an example I just gave. Uh, you might want to put in a counterflow bike lane for that one block so that it accommodates a behavior that otherwise would not be good, but at the same time, the environment encourages it. So it, again, it really depends. And I think what's good about the guide, it gives you, you know, the tools to think through that process and hopefully make the right decision. How can you determine the monetary benefit of a bicycle improvement project? Does it consider impact to other modes? And does it tend to compare favorably to vehic vehicular improvement projects? Um, the tools that I am familiar with do not necessarily uh, compare. I wouldn't say they compare favor favorably. Um, maybe I'm not sure of exactly what that question is asking about comparison with motor vehicle um, improvement projects, but uh, they incorporate several different things, including um, time savings, uh, environmental benefits, um, perceptions of uh, the sort of the quality of your time and the cost of your time, and uh, so there's several different elements of it that um, are incorporated, and then also I think it's really something that more and more studies are, are starting to include is community health or public health, and this gets at both the uh, recreation, or not the recreational, but the exercise components as well as the reduced emissions, kind of that um, double benefit of uh, exercise and um, environmental benefit. Does the guide discuss appropriate design applications for bike use in seasonal communities, say a beach community, where in summer they, there may be more bikes and peds than vehicles in some roads, but in off-season very few bikes and peds? And does it offer any suggestions for cost-efficient design? Uh, I think that that's an area, I mean, that's a pretty specific uh, circumstance, and I suppose there are a couple of others. You know, the guide is intended it, as, as a sort of national um, guidance manual. It's intended to address a broad array of, of situations, and so it does not necessarily get into specific details, although it does provide considerations for um, some of the some of the features that should be considered and certainly provide this chapter provides a good process that any local designer or planner should go through when they're evaluating a situation like that. Does the new guide talk about what types of traffic calming measures are most appropriate for different types of bicycle facilities? It, you know, uh, it, it, I don't think it fits into the issue of saying these are the most appropriate because it's not a traffic calming guide. But what it does do, and, and, and Jennifer alluded to this earlier too, is in two different sections, it gives examples of good traffic calming measures. And one is related to the discussion of the bike boulevards uh, where it talks about these are the kinds of things you can do. And then in the subsequent chapter, which we'll cover in another webinar, it, it talks again about about some of the common traffic calming principles. But it, it doesn't get into a detailed evaluation and say this one's better or this one's not better. But it also relates back to, again, the point of a lot of these things. I think sometimes we maybe want too much guidance. Um, and the answer, of course, is it depends. Uh, the one location that's you know, appropriate for a mini circle, uh, the next location is going to be probably the worst thing you can do. So it's, it's really location specific. And so um, you really have to bring you know, good judgment to all this decision making. And, and I think that the good thing about the guide is it does provide you with the information to make those informed decisions. Um, so that as you're looking at this situation, you can understand the context and choose the mo most appropriate treatment. Is there any president precedent or guidance within the bike guide for developing a, a bike trail along an active rail corridor where one line has been abandoned? I'll, I'll take a, a crack at that one. Um, that question came up, I think, in the previous uh, webinar we did. It doesn't specifically give design guidance on, on uh, rails with trails, if you will, uh, but two things. One is that it gives you a lot of 
design guidance on designing shared use paths that those same that same guidance in terms of setbacks and in terms of fencing and all the all the different details. Uh, that guidance certainly can be applied to a railroad trail. And then uh, maybe Jennifer, you want to chime in on the uh, Federal Railroad Administration guidance. Yeah, um, Federal Highway Administration and the Federal um, Railroad Administration jointly published a study um, a few years back on rail with trail best practices. And it has a chapter on design guidance for rails with trails. And, um, and you know, the, the thing is the issues about appropriate setback and, and, um, and what the, the right type of separation is have a lot to do with um, the characteristics of that rail line. And, and also, the different railroad companies have different opinions on, on what the appropriate level of separation is and what, whether or not it's even a feasible solution. And so, um, so there's really no hard and fast rules when it comes to um, the, the separation between a, a pathway and an active railroad. Um, but certainly, they exist all over the country. and um, and can, can be great facilities. So, I would go to that that study for more information. I'm sure it's it's on the pedestrian and bicycle information website, or you can just Google rail with trail um, design guidelines. Just to add one thing to that, um, you know, that's guidance uh, at the federal level, and most states have their own. Uh, it's taken that guidance, other guidance, um, and have their own regulations regarding setbacks and things, and you'll find that there's some uh, variation from state to state, just like there's variation between different railroad companies in terms of what their rules are. So uh, the other thing you really want to do is check at the state level. Looking at paved shoulders, uh, and assuming that one meets the width requirements for a bike lane, does the guy discuss whether it's generally better to mark that paved shoulder as a bike lane or leaving it unmarked? Um, I'll answer that. Um, yes, it does. It talks about the benefits of, of marking it as a bike lane, particularly as you enter um, more suburban and urban areas where you have right turn lanes and other, other complexities of intersection design where it's beneficial to provide the bicyclist with guidance as to how to get through that intersection. So yes, it does cover those issues. Great. Does, does the bike guide uh, offer any suggestions on how to best end a bike lane? Uh, I, I know their possibilities are, are dotting the last 50 feet and adding sharrows, um, encouraging people to road to, to merge into the road or, or just share the road sign. Does, does it get into any detail on that? Uh, yeah, the, the bike guide does get into that in Chapter 4, and so I encourage folks to tune in to the um, I think it's going to be the next webinar is going to get into that, to the discussion of that situation and other um, considerations for on-road facilities. Maybe I just add to that too is that it's it's more nuanced than it used to be because uh, you know obviously we have the bike lane ends sign that's in the MEPCD and now uh, quite often uh, a bike lane may for a while become a shared lane marking situation and go back to a bike lane, so it gets a lot more nuance on uh, when those signs are required and when they're not, and it's definitely something that uh, we'll circle back to. Does the guide offer any uh, guidance for snow clearing techniques for bike facilities? It, um, you know, in, that gets into the maintenance chapter at the very end. And certainly, uh, it addresses uh, some of the considerations in terms of, of snow plowing and, and uh, keeping paths clear in the winter. And some communities do that. I don't know that it gets into you know, techniques if you're thinking of the kind of plow and machinery, that kind of thing. That level of detail, of course, won't be there. Does the guide uh, address um reliable uh, facilities for bicyclists who are, who are doing 24-hour utilitarian trips that are, that are all weather uh, protective? I'm 
sorry, I didn't catch the last part of that question. Is, I mean, does the, does the guide address bicyclists' need for a reliable, all-weather, 24-hour facilities so they can, that bicyclists can rely on them for, for utilitarian trips? Uh, well, it does get at issues of, um, I mean, all weather, it, it's not, you're not going to find things in here that necessarily advocate providing covered uh, long distance pathways or bikeways, um, but you do, it does have information on lighting and on providing um, appropriate and continuous connections uh, along a corridor. Uh, again, also in this chapter, it does address safety and considerations for nighttime cycling and um, ways to uh, appropriate countermeasures if you do have issues related to, uh, you know, safety and, and nighttime cycling. Okay. Um, well, that is about all the time we have for questions today. Uh, I, I am being told that the, the link for the promo flyer does work as long as you capitalize ASHTO the P on promo and the F on flyer uh, as listed there. Uh, I did try it on my computer here and it, it worked for me. Um, but if you're having problems still, uh, please email me at webinars at hsrc.unc.edu. Uh, if we did not get to your question today, I'm sorry. Uh, once again, a PDF copy of the slide presentation will be available at www.bicyclinginfo.org slash ASHTO later today, and a recording of today's uh, webinar will be posted to that same site in a couple of weeks. Uh, we're, we're a little backlogged in getting those uh, uh, recordings up, but we will be getting that set as soon as possible. Uh, also, there are still five more webinars on the bike guide over the, the next few months, so if you haven't signed up yet, uh, please do. Finally, I want to remind you that there is a brief survey will appear once the webinar is ended. Again, we very much appreciate you taking your moment to uh, complete it. Uh, thank you again to our speakers, R.J. Eldridge and Peter Logway and uh, Jennifer Toole for answering some of those uh, questions. And thank you to all of you for attending today's TBIC uh, Ashto Bike Guide Series webinar.